Hello, my name is Eric Hanscom. I'm a patent and trademark attorney here in Carlsbad, California. And at least before COVID, I used to uh, travel quite a bit on business and whenever I'd go to a new place, I'd take my drone along. And anyway, when I looked to see where I could fly and maybe where'd be some of the nice places that I could fly my drone around, I really didn't have a good source. I'd look on Dronestagram and I'd look on their map and see if I could see anything interesting. Uh, I might, you know, get on YouTube or I might get in Google and just do a search for a certain location and whether or not they allow drones, but there really wasn't a central depository of information. So I've decided to come up with a new series of videos called Droning On and On about a certain area. And so in these videos, I'm going to discuss um, how you get there, what you do there, what the rules and regulations are, and any other tips that you might need to successfully take your drone to a new location and have a good time there. For my first video, I'm going to cover Svalbard. Svalbard is a small island archipelago north of Norway. It has on one of its islands, uh, Nyalesund, which is the northernmost inhabited town in the world. So it's very close to the North Pole. So if you want to find out more about Svalbard, uh, go ahead and watch on. If you just want to see the videos of Svalbard, um, I'm putting them uh, below there are links to all the videos I've done on Svalbard below so you can check that out if you just rather get right to the videos Now in these videos, I'm going to mention the names of hotels and guide services That provided me with fun opportunities to fly my drone. I'm not getting any kickback I'm not even going to tell them I'm putting their names in here So it's purely for educational purposes if I don't mention the names of any hotels or guide services I use is probably because I didn't find them particularly useful um, for people who want to fly drones. But if you happen to own a hotel or own a guide service and you're really drone friendly, well, please feel free to put it in the comments below. And if you're a guide service uh, who doesn't like drones, we'll put that in there too. And uh, drone flyers can make sure they don't use your guide services. But anyway, I'm not getting any money off this. Um, I'm just putting it in for educational purposes. So to see where Svalbard is, you really have to look on a map. Now, Svalbard is that little island that I circled in red. You notice that it's an awful lot closer to the Arctic Circle than it is to Iceland, which is traditionally seen as one of the colder places where you can fly your drone. So if we look at this map here, you can see that Svalbard circled in red is an awful lot closer to the North Pole than is Iceland circled in yellow. This map shows the four main cities in Svalbard. The capital Longyearbyen is indicated by the star. That's the capital and that's where you fly into in the main airport. Um, at the far upper left is Nyalesund, which is the northernmost inhabited settlement in the world. Um, above Longyearbyen on the right is Pyramiden, which is a, a pretty much abandoned Russian mining town. And the lowest one on the lower left is Barentsburg, which is an active Russian mining town. The main way to get to Svalbard is on airplane flights out of Oslo, Norway. Now I've heard of some airplanes leaving from Tromsø, Norway, and occasionally I hear of a flight from Stockholm or Copenhagen, but by and large, the vast majority of flights go directly from Oslo to Longyearbyen. So you have to get to Oslo first, then you can catch an airline. SAS is the only airline I know of that flies regularly between Oslo and Longyearbyen. When you fly into Svalbard, you'll notice that it's obviously carved by some pretty harsh glaciers. And the name Svalbard is actually Old Norse for Sval, meaning cold, and Bard, meaning edge or ridge. Uh, the name Spitsbergen which is the other name by which this island archipelago is called, uh, means pointed mountain in Dutch. And so these are sort of the two ways that you refer to Svalbard, and these are the reasons why it got the names that it got. So you arrive in Svalbard, and the first thing you do when you get off the plane is realize that you're in a colder environment than you've ever been in before. Um, you make it in from the plane to the 
luggage area as quickly as you can and there you get your first glimpse of a Svalbardian polar bear. The entire population of Svalbard is under 3,000 and it's said that there are more polar bears in Svalbard than there are people. Now the estimates of polar bears especially with global warming on its way range anywhere from 300 to 3,000 at any given time but suffice to say the polar bear is king of Svalbard. Every few years there's an attack by a polar bear on a human in Svalbard that results either in an injury or death to the person and unfortunately also the resulting death to the polar bear. Now um, polar bears basically rule Svalbard and you're reminded of that every time you get near the city limits because the city limits are delineated by a series of signs that show a picture of a polar bear and say basically do not proceed beyond this point unless you have a gun with you or you're with a guide who has a gun. So that's how serious it is. So after you get off the plane and you get your luggage, you get on the one bus. Yes, there is one bus that goes to all of the hotels. So you get on that one bus and you go for a drive and the uh, bus driver shouts out the names of the hotels and you get off at the appropriate hotel. Now I stayed in the coal miners cabins and I picked them for a couple of reasons. First of all, they were the cheapest hotel in town and I was there by myself so I didn't really care about having a nice place for my family because I was just there by myself. A uh, second reason is coal miners cabins are <laughs> not coincidentally located right outside the five kilometer no fly zone around Long Yearbian Airport. So I was able to fly my drone legally right by my hotel and I took advantage of that quite a bit. When I stayed in coal miners cabins I think I paid $108 a night for a very small dormitory style room with two beds. I just checked on booking.com and the prices are up to $152 per night for the same room. So be prepared to pay uh, the further north you go as I say in my videos on Iceland. <laughs> the further north you go the more you can expect to pay. So anyway it's not cheap but it most certainly was worth it and it's a trip that I would most definitely do again. Coal Miners Cabins has a wonderful buffet breakfast that I really enjoyed every day and they have a variety of sandwiches and uh, things like that which you know start about twenty dollars a sandwich and are quite good as well. One nice thing about Coal Miners Cabins they have free dog parking outside in case you have to bring your sled dogs with you. And one thing that really surprised me is the first day I walked out there and was getting ready to fire up my drone and there's this big white reindeer sitting about 20 feet away from me. And when I walked out, it started walking toward me <laughs> closer and closer. And I, I backed away. I figured, okay, I, I don't think I'm supposed to interact with the wildlife quite like this. But I was just amazed that there was a reindeer there. And I went back in and talked to the, uh, to, to the waiter. And he said, oh, yeah, they hang out around here all the time because... They like the cities because there aren't a whole lot of polar bears that come through the cities, so they feel safe. So anyway, during my time in Long Yearbin, I saw a few more reindeer, and I saw this one just about every morning. So it wasn't quite as unique as I thought, but I certainly enjoyed seeing them. I spent some time walking around Long Yearbin, and I found it to be just a delightful little town. I mean, it's it's got under it's got fewer than two thousand residents, but it was really neat. There was a lot of old buildings and uh, you just had to admire the fact that this town was built and exists when it gets absolutely no sunlight for two months every winter. I mean, it was quite impressive. Now, <laughs> funny thing about their attitude toward guns. I come from California where we have politicians who don't like guns very much. Now, in Long Yearbian, they ask you to leave your uh, presumably loaded rifles and pistols outside the door when you go into the stores. So you've got your polar bear rifle there for protection. You just leave it uh, in the gun rack. And then when you walk out, you pick up your, uh, your rifle or your pistol and you pack it again and you go for your walk home. So you're safe. So it's a very different attitude. And as you walk around Long Yearbin, you'll see quite a few stuffed polar bears. Now, it's illegal to take a polar bear uh, that was killed in Long Yearbian off Long Yearbian to sell. And so when a polar bear has to be killed for human safety, the polar bear gets stuffed and put in a bank or a sporting goods store 
or something like that. So as you walk around the town, you see quite a few of these reminders that you're not at the top of the trophic level here, that there's uh, the polar bear holds that spot and has no intention of giving up. So I flew around Long Yearbin quite a bit out of coal miners' cabins, and um, Long Yearbin is a, a town that's basically in a valley going up from um, the Atlantic Ocean here. And it's very cold, the weather changes quickly, and it can go from sunny to uh, rainy and snowy in the matter of five minutes or so. Uh, the valley is quite long, and so just uh, because I was a little nervous about polar bears, I let the drone do most of the traveling and I stayed very comfortably near coal miners cabins and I watched my new buddy the reindeer just to see if he or she decided to start dashing off which indicated to me I should probably get back indoors. But it never happened so I had a very comfortable time flying around the cabins and uh, taking a look at the valley that um, housed Long Yearbian. My first guiding experience was a fossil hike with a guide dog. I did this through Green Dog, which is a company in Svalbard. Now, before I went to Svalbard, I <laughs> I did my homework. I wrote every one of the guide companies and said, hey, uh, I'm coming up there with a drone. I really want to fly my drone. The main reason I'm coming here is to fly a drone. What's your attitude toward drones? And some of the companies were... Um, not exactly drone friendly. And they said, well, yeah, we tolerate drones or one of them actually came right out and said, we don't allow drones anywhere near our hikes. So, okay. Uh, Green Dog was very open to it. And I wrote him back and said, okay, so, I mean, I, is there going to be an opportunity for me really to fly my drone, not just the beginning of the end of this? And they, they wrote back and said, yes, yes, no problem there. And they were true to their word. So, I went off on my fossil hike with a guide dog, and I had a guide who brought along his gun and his guide dog. The guide dog was one of the uh, sled dogs that was sort of heading toward retirement and yet still wanted to get some exercise. So we went off uh, hiking up the glacier with the guide dog, his gun, and the sled dog. I kind of stayed behind them just to, to be comfortable. And uh, ironically enough, I was able to find some fossils. And even more ironically enough, apparently there's so many fossils that our guide said, yeah, you can go ahead and take a moment. It's no big deal. And I ended up with um, fossils that were a little heavier than my luggage allowance. And he said, oh, just tell just tell the people at SAS that you have fossils there and they'll, they'll waive the luggage um, overage. And Sure enough, that's what I did. And they said, oh, you, oh, yeah, you got fossils. Okay, yeah, we'll let you take those out. Sure, don't, don't worry about the overage. So anyway, I don't know if that's still good now. I did this trip in 2019, so maybe things have tightened up. But when I was there, uh, things were nice and loose. So I had a really good time, um, got some fun flying in, and got some fossils to show for it. My next experience was the next day doing a dog sled run, again with Green Dog. And it was, the weather was just absolutely miserable uh, here, at least for me. Um, I had four layers plus their overall body suit on, and I was still cold. It was windy, it was snowing, it was raining, so I didn't even bother getting the drone out of its the drone compartment, but I still had a really good time. Now, needless to say, as I'm sitting there freezing in my now five layers, my guide is wearing just a sweater and a baseball cap. And he's doing fine. And the sled dogs were halfway through the trip. And the guide says we're stopping because the sled dogs are getting hot. And he has to give them water. And I'm looking at him going, y you got to be kidding. The sled dogs are hot. And sure enough, near the end of the trip, the sled dogs, we went by a small river. And the sled dogs went running into the freezing river to cool off because they were getting too hot. And meanwhile, I'm just like, my teeth are chattering. And I'm like, oh, I, I don't know how you people manage to do it. But Svalbard breeds a very, very hardy group of humans and sled dogs. And anyway, I really had a good time. Now, if you're thinking, if you have a question about doing the sled, the sled run, I'd encourage you to do it. I began by thinking, oh, you know, I kind of feel badly about the dogs doing all the work for me just so I can get a cool tour. But there were eight uh, sled teams there. And when the guide picked out the lead dog, that was going to go uh, go on our run. The all the dogs on that dog's team began barking really excitedly, and all the other seven teams began whining and crying 
and they were lying down. They were really, really upset that they weren't chosen to go. So I, I ended up feeling guilty about the other seven dogs, dog teams, because they were obviously very upset they weren't getting to go. So I ended up feeling like I had really helped this one dog team because they'd gotten out to, to go out and have fun. And at the end, the guy let me feed them all uh, slabs of uh, halibut. So they were quite happy and it was quite fun to feed them. Overall, again, very good experience. So next in the agenda was a four day boat cruise on the Spitsbergen Express. And I went with Spitsbergen Guide Services here and again, talked to them ahead of time. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm taking a drone. I really want to fly a drone. Is there going to be time for me to fly a drone? Not just, you know, in the dock at the beginning of the end of the trip. They assured me it was and they lived up to their end of the bargain. And so I got quite a bit of wonderful drone flying here. Now, one thing you should know about Svalbard is that the weather's a little different than where I live in Carlsbad, California, and it changes frequently. So the first thing that happened was our captain informed us that there was too much sea ice to do the trip as we had planned. And it was actually kind of rough out there so that we we're going to go on the first day to Pyramiden instead of out to sea. And everybody was cool with it. And um, anyway, then once we hit the water, this was in the protected bay. We became very happy that we were out in the open ocean. This is what happened. So you don't think that that was the weather the entire trip. Two days later, this is what we voted through. So sovereignty over Svalbard had been kind of up in the air for the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. But by the 19th century, there were an awful lot of different countries that were trying to do whaling and mining and things like that. And this all culminated in 1920 when the Svalbard Treaty was signed. And at the Svalbard Treaty, sovereignty was granted to Norway. However, all the signatory countries were granted what are called non-discriminatory rights to fishing, hunting, and mineral resources, which means basically anybody who signed the Svalbard Treaty can set up shop there. And so Pyramiden, as you can tell from the sign, and the style of the buildings is an old Soviet mining town. The next chance I had to fly my drone was when we went on a glacier hike. And while the captain was preparing a delicious lunch, the guide took us in the Zodiac, brought along his gun, explained about polar bear behavior and how we can hopefully tell the difference between a polar bear that is just curious and a polar bear that would like to eat us. Anyway, we got up to the glacier and I had a chance to fly my drone around. Quite a load of fun. So our next stop is a beach full of walruses. and. We didn't fly drones here because it was an environmentally sensitive area, which I understood. Uh, but it sure was interesting to watch these huge marine mammals 
lumbering around. After seeing the walruses, our next harbor was Nialison, and uh, as you can tell from the, the video here, the wind had stopped. It was still kind of overcast and cold, but at least the wind had stopped, so we were getting some beautiful boating weather. By the time we got to Nialison, the weather had cleared, and it was actually sunny and pleasant. And we spent an hour or so walking around the town. Now, Nialison is a very small town, only has a couple hundred people here. Most are involved in the local scientific research and things like that. So there's no drone flying allowed because it might interfere with some of the scientific machinery they have there. I had no problems with it and uh, just really enjoyed my, my tour around the town. As a matter of fact, if I ever have a chance to go back there, I would absolutely love to. It's just a marvelous little town, beautiful things to see, a wonderful museum. Um, relics from the past and all sorts of pretty little flowers. So I really enjoyed my two nights at Nealison. Now, Nealison was a very small town, so I ran into quite a few of the do not proceed beyond this point for fear of polar bear signs. And um, there is also uh, information on how to actually discharge your gun and make sure it was working before you headed out into polar bear territory. Now, I didn't run into any polar bears, but I did run into the second most fearsome animal in the Arctic, and that is the Arctic Tern. And I was just walking through town, minding my own business, and I walked by the radio tower, which was protected by a chain link fence with... Um, oh. Uh, barbed wire on the top, so I didn't think uh -oh. much of it. Um, and then I got dive bombed by these terns. Uh -oh. Guys, apparently they well, apparently they had set up uh, their nests inside there, and they didn't realize that none of us were going to climb over the barbed wire to attack them anyway. They gave it to me pretty Ooh. well. Okay. All right. And as is traditional, when we left the Allison, we were uh, sent away with a wonderful serenade from the Neilison band, uh, kind of world famous for having the most out of tune instruments and unseen playing in the entire world. But we appreciate the effort. So soon it was time to leave Neilison, and we headed out in somewhat cloudy weather, but it turned into sunny weather and was the droning day of my life. So this day was perfect. There was no wind, there was no snow, no rain. It was beautifully sunny. We spent the entire day cruising around icebergs, going into beautiful bays, seeing walruses, and I'm just going to let the video do the talking on this.
So I hope you found this video useful and if you have the chance to visit Svalbard and you have anything else to add to this video, please put it in the comments below. Again, I'm hoping that these videos will sort of turn into sort of a digital library of where you can fly and what you need to know before you go. So thanks again for watching and bye bye.